With the whole world shifting online and classrooms moving into the cloud, it seems wise for us to take a moment to talk about what it means to be good digital citizens, what it means to recognize the rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of living, learning, and working in an interconnected digital world and acting in ways that are safe, legal, and ethical. When we have access to a whole world of digital content, it becomes easy, sometimes too easy, for us to lift images, audio, video, and text and use these elements illegally. Just because we can physically download a file doesn't mean that we can legally download and use that file. Remember, access to something isn't the same as rights to something. At the risk of oversimplifying a very complex and ever-changing topic, copyright law, I'm going to outline four major types of rights and explain what's legal and what isn't when it comes to using digital content for school. In a nutshell, there are a range of protections that creators of intellectual property can place on their work. Knowing the rights of the creator is critical to knowing what type of permission we have to use that creation. The first way to protect intellectual property is through copyright. You've probably heard of this before. Copyright is the most stringent of the intellectual property rights and is outlined extensively, and I mean extensively, in Title 17 of the United States Code. Copyright law is pretty lofty stuff. It even has a constitutional provision in Article 1, Section 8, and I quote, The Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. End quote. Copyright protects the person who created the intellectual property by giving him or her exclusive rights to reproduce, distribute, display, or sell a creative work. In general, if something is under copyright, do not download, do not pass go, do not collect $200, just walk away. The second way to protect intellectual property is Creative Commons. Now this one you may not have heard of before. Creative Commons is a range of rights that a creator can choose from, like sharing and remixing, which makes it way more flexible than copyright. The licensing options work like a menu, and creators of intellectual property can select as many or as few of the components as they like. The full mix and match menu can be found at creativecommons.org, but I'll go over the main components now. The first is attribution. This license lets others distribute, remix, tweak, and build upon your work, even commercially, as long as they credit you for the original creation. Then there's share alike. This license requires that other creators using your work also license their new creations under the same terms as yours. This license is often compared to copyleft free and open source software licenses. Next, there's no derivatives. This license requires those using your work to make sure that your work is passed along unchanged and in whole with credit to you. And finally, there's non-commercial. This license means that the person using your work can't make money off of it. They may not use it for commercial use. Commercial use is one primarily intended for commercial advantage or monetary compensation. The third way to designate intellectual property rights is through the public domain. Works in the public domain technically belong to the public usually because the copyright has expired or because the creator of the work dedicated it to the public domain. You can think of public domain artists as either super generous or super dead. Shakespeare's plays are a great example of creative works in the public domain. Anyone can access, use, or share these plays because Shakespeare's rights to his intellectual property have long since expired. Typically, works under copyright move into the public domain somewhere between 120 years after the creation or 70 to 100 years after the death of the author or creator. These dates are pretty fuzzy and actually change based on the country of the original copyright, but if you're curious, Gutenberg.org is a great place to start for books that are in the public domain. Finally, there's fair use. 
Now, teachers tend to throw around the term educational fair use as a catch-all to grant permission to use any content we like anytime we like it. But that's just not how fair use works. There are a couple of important factors at play for providing wiggle room to both educators and students wishing to use material under copyright for their classes. The first factor in determining if something falls under educational fair use is whether or not the use is, well, educational. Bay Area teacher Diane Main often gives this example. Say a teacher wants to reward her students for being really good this week. She shows the Disney movie Aladdin as a fun Friday treat. Educational? Nope. But let's say that same teacher decides to use specific clips from the movie as part of her unit on contemporary world issues and the portrayal of people from Middle Eastern countries in the media. Educational? Absolutely. To be considered educational fair use, it has to have an educational purpose. The second factor in determining fair use is how much of the work will be used and how often. The reason this matters is because ultimately copyright comes back to the effect on the market. How will your use of this work change the value of the work? Are fewer people buying the text because the teacher is scanning it and posting it to the learning management system? Do classmates no longer need to download a new hit song because a few students have used it as the background music for their video project? The general rule of thumb is that if you use 10% or less of a work for an educational purpose, you're probably in the clear. The only time when using more is acceptable is for the purpose of parody or satire. If teachers plan to use the same copyrighted story or the same article year after year, they should probably get permission or have students purchase a text containing what they need. Now, obviously, fair use is out the window if you plan to use the material for commercial purposes or plan to post copyrighted material to the open web. If you need to share copyrighted material with your class digitally, you'll need to share that file privately through the learning management system, which is password protected and limited to your class. The good news is it's pretty easy to find images and music that are licensed under Creative Commons or that are in the public domain. Of course, your safest bet for including media in your work for school is just to create it yourself. If you're set on finding media from other artists, you can absolutely use images and songs that you find online, but you'll need to get used to filtering your searches by usage rights or starting at sites like ccsearch.creativecommons.org instead of just Googling. There are tons of awesome sites that do the filtering work for you, and some that curate media from up-and-coming artists who are excited to share their work for credit. The Harvard Law School Library has curated a fantastic list of sites that have multimedia content that's legal for you to use. I've linked to this list and a few of my favorite sites for audio and video in the description for this video. So here's the TLDR. Just because you can access a piece of media doesn't mean you have the rights to use it. Check the license, honor other people's intellectual property, and when in doubt, remember, you can always make it yourself.